Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Coming up on Market to Market, dredging helps, but traffic is still slow on the mighty Mississippi. Small and medium packers get an injection of cash from USDA. The future of the Farm Bill hinges on Tuesday's election. I think that could create... Some and market analysis with Sean Hackett, next. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow. For over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, November 4 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. The worker appears to be the must-have item this approaching holiday season, as employers are still putting up the help-wanted signs in the window. The economy, well, it added 261,000 jobs in October. The unemployment rate rose from a 50-year low to 3.7 percent. That's up two-tenths of a point. Factory orders increased last month by a tenth of a percent, bucking the conventional wisdom that the economy is slowing. The trade deficit widened in October for the first time in six months as computer chips and consumer goods came into the U.S. and food and energy exports left the country. Now, last year, we all heard about big logistical challenges at ports of call in the U.S. Now the transportation challenge involving boats and water is an inland one along the Mississippi River. Peter Tubbs reports on how river traffic is moving along with what little water is still there. A dramatic drop in water levels on the Mississippi River is slowing the movement of goods along the center of the country. Barge traffic is being limited to alternating traffic in some areas, as well as limits to the size and draft of barge groups. We're dealing with extreme low water conditions and in certain areas, uh, we haven't seen it this low since, uh, since the 80s or even before that. Uh, it's definitely created navigational hazards along the marine transportation system, uh, but we've been working very closely with the Army Corps of Engineers who have put in a lot of work over the past decade uh, in preparing for a situation like this. The Lower Mississippi River is currently limited to a similar barge draft restriction that is standard on the Upper Mississippi. We're about 40 percent, in some cases half, 50 percent. You know, the industry is, is very resilient, working with the core to make sure that, let's say the core is dredging 12 hours and then we'll stop for 12 hours so that queue can, of, of barges and boats can get through. Um, at its worst, we had 2,200 barges directly impacted uh, with 150 boats waiting. Depending on the duration, again, this could be an unprecedented disruption. Little precipitation in the watershed means that low water levels will probably continue in the near term. Our problems on the Mississippi River are not only their, their time and space related because of widespread drought throughout the whole Mississippi River drainage basin and the time period that we've been in drought in this situation. The left-hand side is percent of normal precipitation over the last 30 days. The reddest areas are less than 25% of average precipitation. And you can see looking on the right hand side for the last year, we have very dry conditions, less than half average precipitation throughout much of the plains, uh, a little bit better in the Ohio basin. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Consolidation can lead to concentration in an economic sector. See big producers of cars, soda pop, and airlines for more. The meatpacking industry has its own big four. And the Biden administration is trying to assist small and medium processors with getting a bigger piece of the market share. David Miller reports. By lack of competition. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Capitalism without competition isn't capitalism. It's exploitation. In January, President Joe Biden announced the allocation of $1 billion in funds 
to advance expansion of small to medium-sized meat packers and processors. All of us, farmers and ranchers who deserve a fair shake, American families facing high prices at grocery stores deserve a fair price to put food on the table. This week, the administration made good on its promise and announced the release of more than $223 million in grants and loans to help small and mid-sized processing plants expand or come back online. The move is part of USDA's multi-pronged investment approach that will assist producer-focused business models to help farmers and ranchers build small-scale, federally inspected packing facilities, give locally owned processing plants the ability to expand, and provide funds to reopen shuttered plants, bringing jobs and revenue to rural communities. According to USDA, four meatpacking companies control 85 percent of the beef market, four processing firms control 54 percent of the poultry market, and four processors control about 70% of the pork market. For Market to Market, I'm David Miller. The general election on November 8th will determine all members of the House of Representatives and 34 Senate seats. The next Congress is scheduled to take up the next version of the Farm Bill. Elections have consequences, and I spent some time talking with the issues with University of Illinois Agriculture Policy Professor Jonathan Coppice. Now, he's worked on farm bills as a staffer and now studies them as we discuss in this abridged version of the M2M podcast. A lot about what Congress will do or can do that will be determined by this election. I and mean, I think we have very stark differences in governing um, philosophy or ideology and direction, and those things will, will have a huge impact on it. Are there areas that matter more um, geographically where members come from and carrying weight in these discussions? Farm bills are really regional. Uh, we have kind of this three-part sort of farm uh, coalition where we have the Midwestern corn interests, we have wheat interests in the Western uh, plains in particular, and then the Southern commodities, cotton and rice and peanuts. And so a lot of farm policy is sort of dictated by how those three interact or work together or don't work together or kind of the conflicts and negotiations around that. And then I, I you think a lot about how that that coalition or that group of interests then kind of are, are driving forces and getting a farm bill, particularly through committees. And then your bigger coalition really involves the food assistance program and the supplemental nutrition assistance program which has become, well, it's always been very political, it's become much more partisan uh, in recent years and has been a huge uh, challenge for writing a farm bill whenever there's this sort of partisan attack on it. So you've got the farm interest, you've got the low income food assistance, and then you have conservation, which really is kind of a connective tissue between um, a lot of farm country and a lot of non-farm country because you know the impacts on natural resources like water, uh, like habitat uh, and those sorts of things really come through the conservation titles. You're a policy guy, maybe not necessarily an election guy. Um, <laughs> however, let's put the two together. Is there a certain, I guess I don't, po a, a certain party in charge is one question, but a certain type of leader that could emerge in either one of these scenarios, if it is a red wave or if blue stays in power, on how maybe some of the questions that you just mentioned are answered? Yes, I, I think what we've seen, again, using the, mo the two most recent farm bill cycles as our kind of, uh, the meeting. our example, our, what we can work from uh, as the most recent history. In those cases, uh, the House of Representatives in particular focused very much on budget cutting by Republican uh, leadership. And when that is the case, obviously the biggest budget item is SNAP. And so we sort of, you can almost see it happen. If we redirect to the, you know, to the budget, 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 how do we cut spending? How do we, you know, deal with deficits and so forth? Then you just see it progress into, well, then we've got to go after SNAP. And once you do that, it really complicates or uh, nearly tears apart that coalition. And then the votes that you need to get through as I like to say that once you go down, you know, once everything's, uh, you know, uh, once everything's a budget issue, you know, kind of the old, if, if all I have is a hammer, everything's a nail. 
it doesn't end with SNAP. I mean, they're going to look at farm subsidies. They're going to look at crop insurance and conservation. It, it, it becomes a sort of we've got to cut, cut, and cut. And so it is a counterproductive policy discussion. It becomes very partisan and it becomes, you know, very hard to hold together a coalition that is needed to get the votes uh, in Congress. Those involved in agriculture think it's pretty important. Um but does that issue resonate with the regular voter uh, in all of these congressional and Senate districts that this is something that you I don't see an ad for Congress or Senate on my TV that highlights so and so will cut everything in the farm bill or will bloat it. I don't see it. Do you? You know, it is uh, sort of, uh, you know, thinking through history, I, I think the last time we can we can kind of pinpoint where a farm bill uh, policy may have had an impact on an election it was probably 1954, at least from the arguments from, from a lot of the players at the time. Um, so it's not, you're not likely to see any, you know, political ads really focus in on this. And I mean, that's just the nature of a 30 second ad and that sort of brutal skim across the top of things that politics and campaigning kind of requires. But I think it's this this sort of governing philosophy that that matters. Are we thinking about policies and programs in the sense of, you know, we, we talk about inflation, for example, and inflation, inflation, inflation is a big issue. OK, the, the follow on question is, well, how do you address it? What are the things that 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 a member or a candidate are going or say they're going to do to actually address inflation? How do you view it? You know, if it's all budget cutting, well, a program like SNAP will increase in an inflationary situation because the cost of food that's used to calculate those benefits is going to, is going to go up to some degree. Um, and so I think, I think there are those kind of guider, guidance pieces that you get out of your 30 second commercial. Like if this is a candidate looking, um, looking at, at some of the partisan you know, budget pieces, then you can imagine that, that they're gonna have a, a challenge with the farm mm -hmm. bill. The full conversation with Jonathan Coppice is available now on our YouTube channel and where you get your podcasts. Next, the Market to Market Report. Black Sea blockades dominated nearly every day and market. The nearby wheat contract added 19 cents while the December corn contract was even this week. The soy complex felt outside market pressures in addition to the actions of Vladimir Putin. The January soybean contract improved 62 cents. December meal lost $5 per ton. December cotton expanded 14.82 per hundredweight or 21%. Over in the dairy parlor, December class 3 milk futures rallied $1.56. The livestock market was lower. Low, lower. December cattle shed 135, December feeders cut 75 cents, and the December lean hog contract dropped by 312. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index added 17 ticks. December crude oil gained 453 per barrel. Comex gold improved $36 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs commodity index surged almost 28 points to finish at 664.80. Joining us now to provide some insight, Sean Hackett, welcome back, Sean. It's great to be in blustery Iowa. Oh, you and you bring in this cold weather to us. Just keep it where you're at. Uh, well, at least we're not snowing yet. You'll be home before it starts That's to true. snow. That's true. Uh, we're getting some much-needed moisture in wheat territory. That's a very important thing I'll ask you second. But first, we need to talk about Vladimir Putin. How much longer do his actions, words, and sayings carry weight in this wheat market, making it as volatile as it has been this week? I think this last week's... Rope a dope, we're calling it, really hurt his credibility. I think a lot. The next time something happens there, we're going to be reacting less and less and less. Kind of like with the trade war, we acted, started to act less and take it less seriously. I think whatever whatever happened this week, it was definitely suspicious of some kind of manipulation that I don't think is going to go down well with the market going forward. I think they're going to focus more about weather and those kind of things and less about what's going on there, unless something really happens that's an escalation from before. Major weather system coming through wheat areas that need it. You saw in the piece just a few minutes ago about the departure from normal. So if you get normal in Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, are we still planting in dust? Will these bins bust or are we going to go bust on the market? 
Well, I mean, you know, we have the worst rated conditions, I think, ever since 1986. Um, we still can benefit from rains. We still can get some plantings done. We can still improve conditions going into dormancy. But still, when you look at starting conditions and ending yields, it really still matters what happens after dormancy. We're pretty encouraged that we're going to have an early spring with some decent moisture as we get more of an El Nino pattern this coming season. So I think this will definitely take the edge off the worry in the winter wheat market. What do I do to lean into this volatility then? We've been saying to our customers for months, anytime you get this geopolitical fireball that goes up in the wheat market and you get this premium on, we want to be cash sellers. We have been cash sellers. And then we try to avoid being that when they take those, that premium off. I think that's going to continue to be the strategy until we, you know, we move into some other kind of a pattern. Corn was pulled along for the ride a little bit, finished the week even. How's that possible anymore? <laughs> EKG of a rock, we call it, is the, is the pattern we've been seeing. And, you know, that's really, you know, soybean prices had been weak before this, this week, um, and that was dragging corn down. You have the wheat market dragging the corn up. But we do think we're going to enter a different phase for corn. December is coming, and we're very worried about Argentina drought and losing acres that they're not planting now. They're going to switch over to more soybean acres. We think there's going to be some kind of a weather reaction rally in corn when we go into December. So I think this sleepy, quiet EKG of a rock market can wake up. So you're not buying into the, if it gets to $7, sell? Well, remember the last time we were on the show in all, early August, you know, we were very constructive thinking we could have a rally in the late September. We have been making cash sales. It's a good price. There's a lot of good cash bases in the country. I'm not saying not to make cash sales, but keep some powder dry for December. We never know what a weather market's going to do or how far they're going to take it, but I would want, would want to have some ammunition to make cash sales in December. How about December of 23, which is our first question we're going to ask. Uh, Phil in Dresden, Ontario wants to know, Sean, with all the volatility and uncertainty in world grain markets, should farmers refrain from pricing new crop 2023 corn with D's 22 at 684 and D's 23 at 628? That's quite a bit of difference. Or should we be paying more attention to it? Well, our general view is we're going to have a much more favorable weather growing season in 2023. El Nino is going to be coming. We expect we could have a record production season. That low $6 price level, which does not look attractive today, may look very attractive come next summer. So once again, just like anything else, it's not, you shouldn't go ahead and sell your entire crop right now. But getting some cash sales on the books at this price level, I think, is not a bad idea. But by how much? I mean, what more range are we talking? I mean, I guess I did say $7 earlier. You're saying below six is something we could see if weather grows well, or I, I'm sorry, if weather happens and, and, and impacts us well next year? Well, I mean, I, in 2021, we got down under five um, for a little while there before we rebounded. And then last year, we got into the mid fives. So there's no reason to think that we wouldn't find our way back into that mid four to mid five range with a big crop, big ending stocks. Obviously, there's the currencies and other things that may determine how lower where it goes, but there's no reason to believe why we couldn't see. Looking at some of the declines and things like cotton, you know, the downside could be considerably more than we might think. Which market has, or which commodity has the biggest influence on outside markets? You kind of teased it a little bit there with corn. Is it corn or soybeans? Right now, you know, I think that the soybean market with today's news is taking a leadership role in outside news. Today, you know, we got, you know, pretty strong news that reopenings or the zero COVID policy from China may start to ease or come to an end. And we saw soybeans really react strongly today, whereas corn and wheat really didn't react that much. So I think that if that story gains traction, if the dollar reversed today, the Chinese currency really moved higher, crude oil was up a lot, cotton was almost limit up. You know, I, th I think there's something going on with this, that this could shift who the leadership role is. Soybeans might have that new found um, sensitivity to international news. I guess take my first question about wheat, cross out the name Vladimir Putin and put uh, <laughs> President Xi in there, yeah. influencing the soybean market. Does it hold the same weight that it once did in soybeans? I think now that he's been indoctrinated as ruler for life, apparently, um, he's now in a position to be, take strong action. And I think whenever you, when he says something or he makes uh, a statement about something, I think we need to take it very seriously now. Before, you know, I think he was very much you know, iffy, iffy about things, but I think it's going to be very clear, very direct, and I think they need to get some food into the country. I think they're a little short.
All right, so the range on, we're at 469 is what we closed on Friday in the March contract. What's our range right now for the next three months? On? On soybeans, March soybeans. Well, I mean, I think that if they are in the reopening phase and we have this weather scare, which also would impact soybeans, you know, I think the range is going to be something along the lines of maybe, let's say, 15 and a half on the upside um, to 13 and a half on the low side, depending on exactly how the weather plays out. I do think this reopening um, story, if, it's, if it really gains traction, you know, can, uh, you know, can help the soybeans quite a bit here. And I did not say 14. I meant to say 14 earlier. Sorry to throw you off, because that's why you were looking at me kind of funny. Uh, China also is a big uh, thumb on this cotton market. Last week, a uh, major drop. This week, major rise. Why? When cotton was up to $1.20, it was trading at the highest premium to Chinese cotton prices in history. We lost the business. We came crashing down, worried about the economy. Then we got back to a more normal relationship, business coming back. And then we get this news that they might reopen. Of course, that's phenomenal news for purchases and that sort of thing. And we're starting to move back. However, the cotton price in China did decline considerably since U.S. cotton was $1.20. If you work the math, 90 cents a pound would get us back to a very high level, relative value level. And so we are thinking that probably puts kind of a, a ceiling on the market based upon that relationship because you you know exports to China really rule the US price so a ceiling of we're not getting back above 100 I don't think so <laughs> and you know I really those don't days believe are gone I think those days are gone um, we have the tie supplies you know that we've seen in a long time but that relationship with the cotton price in China is really going to rule where we modulate that cattle market that has been a we talk about uh, a constant worry or hand wringing of what are we going to do with the, the holidays? What are we going to do with the food on the table? What are we going to do about this live cattle market? Where are we headed? In the feeders, I'm worried because if I'm right about corn and a weather scare in, in December, that means a higher corn price is probably going to keep the pre, you know these prices down on the feeders. The live cattle market. I think we have enough beef to get through the holiday season. I'm worried. Delayed reaction of monetary policy. There's a three to six month reaction delayed to when it impacts economic activity. When you work the numbers, we could be hitting right into that, you know, November, December time frame with a brick wall of demand with very, very high beef prices. I just don't think the current cattle price can, can maintain this level right now. So when's this November, December? This of 22? Yeah. So right, we're facing it right now. We're, we're, um, I believe is the first rises that we saw are going to start impacting the market in November and December. And then they continue to escalate as you go forward. So the top of that chart for four months, we're not going to see that for a while. Or we're going to go up higher. Right now, I believe we're making a top where we are right now in the live cattle market. And we're going to be rolling over and correcting into the end of the year. I really find it hard to imagine when we have ample supplies and we have this brick wall of demand that we see coming that we're going to be able to maintain the buying of live cattle at these prices. I think I'm worried about correction into the end of the year. Okay. Uh, you talked on feeders just a little bit. I want to circle back up here. If December is when we could see a rise in corn, am I buying as much as I can for feed needs right now? Well, I think for your short-term needs, yes. I think this is the time to be looking at getting some done and protecting against that near-term potential move higher. The longer-term picture, as we discussed earlier, I'm kind of on a negative side on corn on the longer term. So this is not a time to go buying long-term needs. Make sure you're buttoned up your short-term needs. Okay. Uh, hog market, a couple weeks in a row. We had a little life, but it's back to that trend lower. How much lower are we headed? Well, I still am in the camp that says that China needs to buy pork before the holiday, their New Year holiday season. Um, we think they're going to come in strong to buy either way if they reopen or not. Um, the hog price in China remains very good. The pork price in China remains very good. There's a pork shortage. And I think we're going to get some very good business now into the end of the year and we're going to drive the price back up again. But so many times I hear someone sit in your chair and they say that's already factored into the market. How is that not factored in already? Well, I don't think it is because we've only been seeing some of the business just recently. And prices really, when you look at the chart, haven't really done anything. So to say that it's, there's expectations built in, well, it would ha that would be the case if it had a, we were near the highs or we had a big move. We really, we really, we've been pricing in, no one really expects anything really to happen. And I guess I'm asking, we expect at some point China was going to reopen. And, and that's why I thought maybe the market had, would go a little higher. Well, 
I, you know, it's been my thesis and other people's thesis is that when Z came out of this Congress meeting, that he would begin the process of reopening, and it looks like maybe that is happening. Okay. There's nothing bad about that for, for pork demand and for pork exports to China, so, so I think there's a runway here. If we can get some follow through next week, watch the Chinese currency. If it can break over 14 resistance, that to me says this story is for real. And guess what, Sean? We have to go from one runway to another. We're going to take off to the end of the show. Thank, Thank you, you sir. Appreciate it. All right. That is Sean Hackett. And we're going to put a pause on this analysis and we'll continue with Sean and answer more of your submitted questions in our Market Plus segment. Find that on our website of markettomarket.org. We have that in both podcast and in YouTube form. All of these resources, they are free. The first quarter of school session is in the books, but we are still adding to our classroom portion of our program. Each week, new content is added to the commodity markets and other sections of the site, which can be found at markettomarket.org slash classroom. Next week, we'll take a look at the scope of the latest HPAI outbreak. Thank you so very much for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.